Hello everyone, I'm Nikit Agarwal, a software engineer at Meta, and today with my colleague Dan, we're going to be talking about a work called Transparent Memory Offloading, or TMO, a technique we've deployed in Meta's data centers to improve memory efficiency. Let me outline the problem, opportunity, and challenges first. So the problem in front of us has been, uh, as this chart shows, generation over generation, the percentage of cost of our infrastructure that DRAM or memory takes. Over time, the memory cost of our infrastructure has gone up. And today it's about one third of our fleet. We spend a lot of money on DRAM today. So we've been looking at the alternatives uh, to replace uh, DRAM spend with something cheaper. The first technique uh, we've kind of looked at is compressed DRAM, which is a software technique where you take memory, compress it, uh, and then store it in DRAM again. So we make better use of the existing uh, hardware DRAM that's on the system. Uh, this chart is showing uh, a compressibility ratio of one is to three, which is very typical of our application. And uh, we can save about two thirds of the cost of memory if uh, we can deploy compressed DRAM for some of the memory on our systems. Next, uh, we also employ a very capable SSD on each of our servers in Meta's fleet. This chart is showing the cost of our infrastructure that we spend on these SSDs. And as can, as can be seen, there's a huge opportunity for us uh, if we take some of the DRAM uh, pages that go into DRAM today and put them on SSDs. Uh, we can uh, save a lot of memory cost. However, a common property of these uh, both compressed DRAM and SSD is they are much slower than DRAM. So we needed to be careful about uh, what uh, memory we are taking from DRAM and putting them into slower memory tiers. The opportunity in front of us was cold memory. This chart is showing across uh, major workloads of our fleet, the percentage of application memory that happens to be cold. And we define cold as uh, pages in memory that are not touched very often, let's say once in every two minutes or so. Uh, on average, we see about 33% or 34% of memory in the fleet uh, happens to be cold. And this is a great candidate to be put on slower memory tiers. The other opportunity in front of us was memory tax. Uh, so each of our servers has uh, a subset of memory uh, ranging uh, almost up to 20%. Uh, which is used uh, to do perform operations such as data center memory tags and microservice memory tags. Both of these categories of memory have much more relaxed performance requirements than our workload memory. So again, a great candidate to be put on slower memory tiers. However, we had to tackle a bunch of challenges. Namely, first we needed to figure out how much memory to offload. Uh, we could not take the entire memory on the system and just put them on slower memory tiers. Uh, applications uh, would see a huge slowdown. So we needed to be clever about it. Next, we also needed to figure out which particular memory pages to offload. Uh, scanning the entire page tables would be very expensive in software. So we needed to find uh, intelligent techniques to do that. Thirdly, uh, we also needed to figure out when to offload the memory. When the application is uh, using memory extensively and very often, we had to be very careful about not uh, putting that set of memory uh, into a slower memory tier. So we had to be very clever about it. The fourth challenge in front of us was there's different kinds of memory uh, that are used in our data center fleet, uh, namely anonymous memory or file back memory. We had to tackle each of them differently. Finally, we had a lot of hardware. We have a lot of hardware heterogeneity in the fleet. Uh, over time, we have deployed multiple generations of SSDs in our fleet, each with different performance as well as endurance characteristics. And the technique we deployed had to be uh, careful about uh, taking this into account. So, with that background, uh, what we did was we built a transparent memory offloading solution something we've deployed in Meta's data centers. Today, we offload anywhere from 20 to 30% of total memory across our fleet. And all the techniques we've deployed uh, is open sourced. Next, uh, my colleague Dan is going to be going into the details of the TMO design. Thanks, Niket. Hi, I'm Dan Schatzberg, and I'm a research scientist at Meta. I work on the containers team on resource isolation and resource efficiency. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the TMO architecture. And imagine for the time being that you have two containers running on a machine. The way TMO works is that we have a component in user space called Senpai, and it periodically triggers reclaim for each of the containers in the system. So this causes the kernel to find some amount of memory and offload it to the backing storage, the file system or swap. 
And then we have another component in the kernel we've implemented called PSI. And what this does is it measures the impact of lack of memory. So for each container, how much did it suffer because we reclaimed all that memory? We feed that information back to Senpai, and then Senpai can make a decision on the next iteration to, say, only reclaim from one container because it showed no impact due to lack of memory, and let the other container be because it started to show signs of lacking memory. And it does this repeatedly, putting just a little bit of reclaim pressure on each of the containers so that all of its cold and unnecessary memory is offloaded. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about each of these three components, PSI, Reclaim, and Senpai, in more detail. So PSI stands for pressure stall information. And what it really does is it measures the impact of lack of resources. You can think of the case of a page fault where a user space thread is executing, hits a page fault, goes into the kernel for some period of time, then is blocked on storage for a little bit, loading in the, the faulted in page. Finally, the kernel maps everything in and suddenly user space is back. What PSI does is it tracks this period of time where user space failed to execute as a memory stall. And you can imagine other cases of memory stalls that aren't just page faults. For example, uh, needing to enter direct reclaim because there's not enough free memory to service an allocation. And PSI expresses itself as a percentage of wasted compute potential. So for each stall, we sum those up as a numerator and we see how many threads this container has and what's, what its compute potential is and use that as the denominator. So one thread stalling in a 100 thread container is not as big of a deal as if that were the only thread in the container. And the nice property of all of this is that PSI scales with storage speed. So if you imagine that you have a slower storage device, the time blocked on storage should be longer, therefore the memory stall would be longer, and therefore your pressure actually increases. And this is why we prefer pressure stall information as a way to track the impact of lack of resources rather than counters like major page faults, which sometimes indicate issues, sometimes don't, depending on how fast your storage device is. I could talk a lot more about PSI. We've actually implemented it for other resources like Compute and I.O., and it's all upstream in the Linux kernel. Uh, there's a lot of other uses like user space um killing if pressure is very high, or just for debugging resource shortage issues. You can see our paper for a lot more details on this. The next component I want to talk about is kernel reclaim. And as Niket indicated, one thing we have to do is figure out what memory to offload. Scanning page tables is a pretty compute intensive operation, and the kernel actually already maintains LRU lists of all the memory in the, the system. In addition to that, the kernel knows how to offload to both file system and swap, which you know, correspond to the file cache in anonymous memory. So our thought was, hey, we'll just reuse the kernel reclaim algorithm to periodically reclaim. It'll keep everything in LRU order, and only the cold memory should get reclaimed. What we found in practice, though, is that this didn't work as we expected. We found very heavy thrashing on file cache, where a lot of pages were getting dumped from the file cache and having to be faulted back in, but anonymous memory and swap weren't touched at all. And if you think about this, this kind of makes sense. The history of when this kernel reclaim algorithm was implemented was when we had very slow spinning disks that could take maybe hundreds of IOPS. In this context, swap is pretty costly because it's pretty write heavy and each of the writes are fairly random across the disks. So you end up getting very high seek latencies because of swap. Whereas in contrast, file cache is generally read only and you can just flush it and read back in file system data when it's accessed, which has a lot better locality than swap does. But nowadays we have very fast SSDs that do hundreds of thousands of random IOPS or even more, uh, or even newer memory technologies or compressed memory as Nick had mentioned earlier that can be used as swap backends that are even faster than the file system potentially. So we really dove into the kernel reclaim algorithm and tried to refine it. The major contribution we made here is we implemented refault detection. And what this is, is that we track when recently resident pages are faulted. So each page, when it gets uh, removed from memory, we keep some amount of metadata that tells us when it was last resident. 
And then if it faults back in, we can compute the refault distance. And if that is smaller than the working set size of the container, we determine that this was a refault. And this tells us that, hey, the file cache that's being flushed actually started to issue refaults where the, the pages being accessed were recently resident. And we have two uses for this. One is to balance swap and file system reclaim. So as soon as file cache starts getting refaults, the kernel switches to an approach where it tries to balance the refaults across swap and the file system. But also for PSI, if you recall, I mentioned that we track memory stalls on page faults, but not all page faults are because of lack of memory. It could be an application starting up or just a working set transition. Uh, refaults allow us to determine which memory faults are those that are because the memory uh, is lacking for the system. The final component I'll talk about is sent by, and as I mentioned previously, it really just drives reclaim continuously. So what sent by does for each container, it measures its PSI metric and tries to keep a very, very low amount of PSI around some threshold, say 0.1%. And what it does is pressure is lower than this threshold. It will up its reclaim volume and continuously ask the kernel to reclaim more. And as soon as the, th the pressure target, uh, pressure exceeds the pressure target, then it'll back off and not reclaim as much. And doing so, it's creating this kind of constant um, amount of reclaim on each container in the system, just enough that there's all the cold memory gone, but not enough that the applications are suffering because of serious lack of performance. So going back to the questions Niket asked at the beginning of the talk, you know, we really had to answer these questions with TMO of how much memory to offload, which memory to offload, and when do we offload? And the three components I introduced answer all these questions. So PSI is really what tells us the performance impact of lack of memory. And so how much memory do we offload? Just enough that PSI starts to, to show some lack of, of performance. On the other hand, which memory to, to offload, rather than some expensive page table scanning, we just rely on the kernel reclaim to maintain LRU and with our changes, balance file and swap. And finally, Senpai maintains constant low but non-zero pressure so that we're constantly offloading memory. Uh, in the next few slides, Niket's gonna talk about evaluation and I'm gonna hand it off to him now. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Next, walk, let's walk through some evaluation results. Let me walk you through a case study of a popular uh, service at Facebook called Web, Web or HHVM. It's a memory bound service. What it means is that over time, the web server becomes memory bound and requests to it are throttled by a load balancer. The chart here shows time on X axis in hours and Y axis is request per second each server is able to handle. Note uh, the drastic drops in RPS are just regular code pushes that we do every couple hours or so. Because this service is memory bound, uh, over time we see RPS dropping uh, and not being able to sustain the peak RPS. The first thing we did was uh, enable TMO and offloaded the memory to SSD uh, for this service. The leftmost picture on this chart is showing time in hours and on the Y axis, we are actually showing normalized mem resident memory size. The bold lines are the baseline where we don't enable TMO and the dotted lines are ones where we enable TMO. Once we offload uh, TMO to SSDs, we see about 5% memory savings uh, for the web servers. The chart on the right is showing request per se second, again, comparing baseline and TMO. And by saving 5% memory, the web servers no longer are memory bound. What this means is we no longer see the RPS drop with TMO. So this additional performance, we are able to recoup uh, and uh, get extra capacity in our feed. Similarly, uh, the last step that we do is enable Z-swap or offloading to memory pool. The data on these web servers is very compressible. We see about one is to four uh, compressibility ratio for the data on web servers. The chart is showing normalized resident memory size, and we see about 14% memory savings by offloading to Z-swap. Note uh, TMO here was able to adjust automatically uh, for a faster memory backend and save more memory as compared to a slower SSD backend. The picture on the right is showing requests per second, 
uh, similar uh, to the offload to SSD part, uh, TMO, uh, because it saved additional memory, made these work servers no longer memory bound, and we saw no RPS drops uh, once we enabled TMO. In production, we use a mixture of offload backends. We use Zswap where we can for more memory savings, but we also have a bunch of workloads that have incompressible data. And for those, uh, Zswap is not effective, so we rely on swapping to SSD for those services. We have ongoing work to make the offload backend choice more dynamic. Today, we do it uh, a bit manually. Finally, let me talk about some fleet-wide memory results. TMO has been deployed in production at Meta for more than a year on millions of servers. This chart is showing across a breadth of workloads uh, and services that are running in our fleet. The memory savings uh, ranges anywhere from five to 20 plus percent. And uh, we have different services on different offloading backends and both of them are pretty effective in saving tons of memory across our fleet. Our journey is not done. There's more disruptive technologies in the memory space that are coming. Uh, some of you might have heard of CXL or Compute Express Link. It's a load store bus to attach uh, different memory media to CPU servers. Uh, we are working on extending our TMO technique to do transparent page placement, which is much more dynamic and doesn't use the swap backend. This is active work in progress at Meta. Let me recap the talk uh, and talk about our contribution again. So we developed PSI, we use uh, the kernel to reclaim memory, uh, and we finally developed a user space agent called Senpai, which tries to offload as much memory as is possible without hurting application performance. Overall, we see 20 to 30% of total memory savings across our fleet, and we've open sourced all the elements of TMO uh, to upstream. Thank you.